Hello, everybody here in the room, and greetings to the people following online through the streaming. Uh, welcome to the 2022 ACOM Seminar Series. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Simone Tilmus. Uh, Simone is a project scientist here at Anchor and uh, the co-chair for the Community Earth System Model, SESM, uh, Chemistry Climate Working Group. Uh, she got her PhD and postdoc um, at the Institute of Stratospheric Research in Ulich, Germany, studying the ozone loss in the Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, she carried out a postdoc here at Anchor uh, on ozone loss and climate change, and she can enumerate several honors, awards, and appointments. Among those, she was elected chair of the Gordon Research Conference on Climate Engineering, and that's going to be uh, active in 2024. Her scientific interests cover uh, the understanding and evaluation of chemical aerosol and dynamical processes in chemistry and climate models. She has investigated past, present, and future evolution of the ozone hole in both hemisphere, based on models and observations. In the last 10 years, she also focused uh, on tropospheric chemistry, aerosols, air quality, long-range transport of pollutants, and uh, tropospheric ozone. She also studies the impact of geoengineering on Earth's climate system, the hydrological cycle, and the impact of solar radiation measurement on dynamics and chemistry in both troposphere and stratosphere. Today, she's going to talk about stratospheric aerosol intervention and its potential effects on the stratospheric ozone layer. For the folks uh, following in streaming, I uh, remind you that you can um, type your questions at any time uh, during, the, um, during the talk uh, in the window below, the Slido window, and I'll, uh, I'll read the questions to Simone at the end of, the, of her talk. And uh, everybody, please help me welcome Simone on stage with an applause. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. Thanks, everybody who is here in the room. Thanks, everybody online uh, for the seminar today. And so, yeah, I'm talking about stratospheric aerosol intervention, uh, which is also known as geoengineering, and the potential effects on stratospheric ozone layer. And I realized that I gave in 2009 a seminar on the effects on geoengineering on ozone. So that's quite a bit ago. And I think we have learned a little bit or see it in a little a little bit different connection, but it's also changing now because the conditions have changed. And we are in a very different situation now than we were in 2009, thinking about geoengineering. So this is an overview of my talk. And in the first part, I want to talk more about, first, the motivation and why are we looking at uh, stratospheric aerosol interventions, and then how much uh, can we actually cool? Of course, I get a phone call. Um, how much can we actually cool the climate with stratospheric aerosols, and uh, how would application look like? Like, I want to talk a little bit about future scenarios and strategies. And that is important because depending on how we apply SAI, uh, we do get uh, different results depending on the strategies, the scenarios, and, and I will go into that a bit. And then the second part, I go really more into questions of stratospheric ozone, describe a little bit about the ozone layer, uh, the effects of SAI on stratospheric ozone, and then the future projected changes and how we see this right now, and what is the dependencies on scenarios and strategies, and uncertainties and challenges. So to start with, <laughs> this is uh, just a motivation to really, everybody knows, yes, we do feel the impact of climate change already now. We can see this and, uh, every day in the news, new extremes, new heat waves, uh, fires like just here in Louisville, and this impacts ecosystems, this impacts societies already now. And uh, we do know that climate is continuing to warm, and the only way to stop is, this is uh, to reduce and phase out as soon as possible CO2 and anthropogenic emissions. And this is a, um, a, a plot that shows global greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the historical. We had an increase, and then the projected changes we will need, the reduction in the global greenhouse gas emissions within the next century and this century to actually reach specific temperature targets. And the green line is what we would need to reach about the 1.5 degree uh, target that is suggested as something that would prevent most and uh, serious impacts, even though we already see 
various impacts uh, by now, and we are pretty close to 1.5. We're about at 1.2 or 3 at this point in warming uh, compared to pre-industrial conditions. But what the pledges are currently uh, looking more like this blue line, and I will point you to the monitor so people online can see the pointer better. And so, yeah, we really have an ambition gap here, even the most uh, optimistic scenarios do not go to a place where we need to go. And so we very likely will not reach these temperature targets, but we will at least overshoot the temperature targets uh, by some amount. We could uh, potentially with that reach uh, tipping points that may be irreversible. We um, do endanger more and more vulnerable scenario, uh, societies and ecosystem, and this may even uh, uh, hamper the uh, changes to alternative energy sources, to move to alternative energy sources. So what are the things we can do? What are the climate responses to climate change? Well, what I said, first of all, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. The atmosphere greenhouse gas emissions, uh, when they increase, we get more warming. Uh, reducing them is uh, through reducing um, either the uh, the, the mitig through mitigation, so the increase in emissions, or uh, through the increase in the loss term, which is done through something that is called carbon dioxide removal. There are various uh, approaches that are proposed how to uh, increase the sink of carbon dioxide uh, in the ocean, over land, and the soils. And um, this is also called uh, geoengineering. However, those three approaches are thought to be rather slow and may be effective uh, towards the end of the 21st century, but they may not uh, be efficient enough to reduce temperatures fast enough to not reach those uh, or to go in an overshoot. And the other way that people talk about is the uh, reduction of the incoming uh, sunlight by reflecting a part of it through, for instance, increasing aerosols in the stratosphere, increasing re the reflectivity of the planet called solar radiation modification. And uh, increasing aerosols in the stratosphere is called stratospheric aerosol intervention. There are also other methods that could be effective, but this one is really the one that is more something that could be done globally, seems to be effective. Uh, you know, more, more immediately. And then there are other things to address climate change, of course. There's adaptation and potentially small scale uh, solar radiation management, which is also thought of somewhat an adaptation method. But the question is really, could we actually, or should we consider SIM as a response to the climate impacts and to reduce potential uh, impacts? And um, the first thing is, can we actually cool the climate with aerosols in the stratosphere? And uh, we would say, yes, volcanoes have shown that we can do this. Because uh, when we look at the time series here, this is temperature anomalies going, um, this is an average between 1950 and 1980. And you see that every time when there was a large volcanic eruption, temperatures have decreased, uh, including this last uh, large eruption from Mount Pinatubo. We saw a decrease of around 0.3 uh, Celsius uh, globally at the surface. And so the question is then, uh, what, do, uh, what happens if you do long-term injections of aerosols, how much can you cool? And we do have already various studies where model, models performed long-term injections of different, uh, you know, SO2 injections per year in the stratosphere. And on the left, uh, what you can see here is a uh, comparison between five different models showing how much cooling we would achieve for a certain amount of injection. So you see that, for instance, for 10 teragram of SO2 injections per year, some models show a cooling of maybe less than half degree, and others go even up to 1.3 Kelvin. So there's a large uncertainty on that. And if we translate this basically to how much actually is needed to cool the climate by one degree, we are, uh, by, with current Earth system models, in the range of 8 to 16 teragram. 
which is about also the uncertainty of the amount of emissions that we had at, during Mount Pinatubo, which is also quite uncertain. So models have a large uncertainty. And it is important, this factor of two is important because it really depends how much we inject, what the impacts on the ozone layer, but also on the climate will be. Because we have more aerosols that will heat more, as we will see later on. So this is important. This is a large uncertainty that we certainly have to address. I said I want to talk a little bit about scenarios, because it depends on, obviously, how you um, apply SAI on what responses or what the results will be for the climate and for ozone. So what is basically an approach we can see as maybe most beneficial to apply stratospheric aerosol intervention? And what you can see here on the left is a um, temperature sketch uh, which shows uh, the business as user scenario here, and then um, the, a green line which would be a scenario where we reach temperature targets which are without any interventions, but with carbon dioxide removal. But as we have, with I, with what I discussed before, we very likely do not reach that. So we likely uh, experience an overshoot in these temperatures, at least for some time, until these uh, more carbon dioxide removal would uh, take place. And so in the meanwhile, the idea is that stratospheric aerosol intervention could be applied. It would be these, these purple arrows show the amount, so you would face it in and then slowly face it out again to cut off this peak. So it's called peak shaving scenario. And it's meant to be something like a stopgap measure at the time uh, while we really putting the other measures into place uh, to prevent uh, reaching, for instance, tipping points. And um, this uh, is, is kind of seen as a, um, well, well, we'll see later, but it leads to, it, this is the only way it would lead basically to, to a stabilization of the climate because strong uh, mitigation and carbon dioxide removal is, is needed. But besides it looking very optimal, there are concerns. And that is that we still have to very likely apply these methods for decades or even centuries. There is also an unknown what this curve would look like. Even though we project that it would go down, it may actually not because there may be unexpected events of, say, methane explosion or other things. So that's a problem that, that we have to consider. Another thing is that there couldn't be major eruptions. I mean, maybe uh, there has to be a global governance to actually control this, and there are additional unknown side effects. And besides, we do still not know all the side effects on this and uh, to continue. So then uh, if we look at something that is maybe the least beneficial or the worst case application, is something you would follow a business as usual or high mitigation scenario. You continue uh, not, uh, I mean, mitigation would be basically delayed, maybe even from the start of SAI, which people are concerned about. That would require that these application would um, continue for basically for a very long time. They need more and more injections of aerosols. And it can come even worse. Uh, it may not be globally organized. It may be chaotic. It may be single actors. And uh, it will definitely not lead for a long time to a sustained climate. So uh, this has uh, even more concern, as I said before. There's also often uh, the mention, which is also the case for the previous scenario, the term termination risk meaning if we suddenly stop, temperature will rush back to the original temperature that we masked uh, within 10 years. And that is a faster climate change than we would see even without uh, geoengineering. So that's not desired. However, why do we actually look at this scenario? Because it is a nice case study for studying the effects of SII. Because we see the effects of continuously increasing emissions, we can see how really getting a better signal to noise uh, ratio. So for scientific purposes, it is quite an interesting scenario, but not for obviously applications. And a third scenario that I want to talk about is a medium SAI scenario, which has been proposed to do just half SAI. 
So not going all the way down to the temperature targets, but half. And it has been shown that uh, there are side effects, and I will talk about it in the next slide, changes in rainfall uh, that could be mitigated if we just cool half the amount. But that's certainly not a very optimal scenario. Either we're not even reaching temperature targets, we could still reach tipping points. But the reason I'm mentioning it here is that there has been an ex uh, experiment from the geoengineering model intercomparison project that exactly used this scenario, and we do have model runs that do look at ozone, and so I can show some results on that in a multi-model comparison study. Uh, other scenarios are needed. This is just three, but this is what I'm talking about today. So depending on future scenarios, we do have different effects on the climate. Uh, if we look here on the left, this is temp surface temperature, and these are different scenarios, a high forcing scenario, again, low forcing, somewhat in the bean. If we apply SAI, we can see, and that has been shown in different models, that we can cool the climate and we can keep temperature to 1.5 C. That means we also reduce all the impacts or many impacts that are related to surface cooling. So it doesn't, in that sense, it wouldn't even matter what scenario we follow. However, as just giving one example, if you look at rainfall, well, again, on the left, have a scenario without, without uh, geoengineering. You see that rainfall is strongly increasing the hydrological cycle with the warming, so it kind of uh, relates to the warming. Uh, but if you apply geoengineering, while the temperature is stabilized, the more SAI is applied, the more the hydrological cycle is slowing and we get a stronger reduction of rainfall, which can cause to changes in the hydrological cycle in, the, uh, uh, in a, a uh, shutoff of the monsoon, of the Indian monsoon in some studies, depending on how much SAI is applied. But there are certainly scenarios with a very strong mitigation scenario and slow and, and very little stratospheric aerosol intervention that can also keep uh, rainfall rates at similar rates, at least in the global sense, not necessarily in the, um, in the regional sense. And then besides looking at scenarios, we also can ch get changes in the effects of stratospheric aerosol intervention depending on the strategy. So we talk about scenarios and then we talk about strategies and what we need in the strategies is how do we apply those stratospheric injections. So we can apply it in the tropics like volcanoes or Mount Pinatuba has done, which uh, causes a very strong um, increase in the sulfate burden in the tropics and less in high latitudes. Or we can apply it, for instance, outside the tropics, uh, here in, in four points outside the tropics, that will lead to a distribution that is more even. And if you look at the climate effects, shown down at the bottom, if we inject in the tropics, we can see that uh, compared, so, so say we um, are in here at the end of the century and cool to 20, 10 to 20, 30 conditions, we see that the temperatures do not go back, uh, globally they go back, but not regionally. So you get an overcooling in the tropics and you get a warming in high latitudes. However, using these other uh, form of injection outside the tropics, or it's in the tropics, but at, at four locations here, 30 north and south and 15 north and south, <clears throat> you can actually see that the cooling is more even. And actually, uh, we have done this uh, with colleagues uh, here at NCA and also uh, Cornell. We, we had developed uh, this uh, kind of uh, feedback algorithm that uh, is implemented in the model and that decides every year how much injection is needed to, for instance, counter this high forcing scenario and keep temperature at 2020 conditions. So every year, this feedback algorithm decides how much injection will be needed to not only keep the global temperature from changing, but also the um, north to south gradient and the equator to pole uh, gradients from changing. So this is a strategy that can actually not only change the global temperature, but really also regionally tries to keep temperature a certain way. And strategies could be also applied differently. You could think about they are, uh, injections are not at this altitude of here five kilometer above the tropopause, can be only one kilometer above the tropopause. It can be at different location, different timings, and even different injection materials. There are studies on using other things than sulfur, and I'm not gonna talk about this here. But in, 
and also different targets, not only temperature targets, but rainfall, crops, and other things. So people use this as a, a, a way to study optimal injections. And so strategies can also help with other things uh, unexpectedly. When you do actually inject in the tropics, we saw that the quasi-biennial oscillation, the tropical uh, variation of the zonal mint, uh, wind is, um, there, there, the, is uh, actually shut down with stratospheric aerosol intervention if you uh, continue injecting a lot. But when we injected at these four points, this was not really happening or in a different way. So there are things that can be done with these strategies in terms of impacts. And as you will see, it also will change ozone in some way. Now, I want to talk about ozone. And uh, that was, yeah, the main topic of the talk. So, uh, yeah, as everybody in this room should know, the ozone layer, uh, most, uh, most ozone is in the stratosphere, and uh, it is very important uh, to protect us uh, from harmful UV radiation. And uh, changes in the ozone layer, uh, reductions and increases, impact, uh, you know, uh, society and ecosystem. It can, uh, reduction of ozone increases UV, uh, and cause skin cancer and cataract. It has effects on the terrestrial and aquatic systems. It impacts tropospheric chemistry. But as I said, also, if you increase the ozone layer and reduce UV radiation, that can have impacts on vitamin D production and also on societies. And so any change in ozone is not desired. But uh, what we, and most people, of course, know that uh, we have experienced uh, the uh, strong, very strong reduction of the ozone layer over Antarctica, uh, going from 1960, 70 to about 2000, we had a strong reduction in ozone due to the increase in CFCs in the stratosphere. And luckily, uh, the uh, implementation of the Montreal Protocol and other protocols have led to this uh, phase, of, uh, phase out of all the CFCs, uh, or, uh, the phase of many of those potent CFCs in the stratosphere. And we do project a de decline um, with also a, a recovery of the ozone hole by about mid of the century expected. And this, uh, the health of the ozone layer is studied uh, and uh, uh, assessed every four years in the WMO ozone assessment report. And for the first time uh, this time around in 2022, we also have a chapter on the impacts of stratospheric aerosol interventions. And that's uh, basically also the motivation for this talk to look into this in more detail. So uh, ozone is, as I said, mostly uh, abundant in the stratosphere, and it does not, it's not steady there, but it is changed depending on the dynamics in the stratosphere. And uh, we know that through the bryodopsin circulation, uh, transport of air masses results in uh, largest ozone in the winter hemisphere, in the north, uh, in the winter hemisphere. As you can see here, uh, this is uh, stratospheric ozone in column ozone, uh, in, in dopsin units, sorry. And uh, the tropics show uh, the least amount of uh, ozone, column ozone. And uh, if you go in October, though, we do see in the time range now, 2000, uh, of course, the strong reduction of total column ozone due to the ozone hole. And what you also see here is the red line is uh, a WECAM result. So uh, models usually reproduce the transport of the bryodopsin circulation quite well, as well as uh, total column ozone. And besides the transport, chemistry is very important. Uh, we do know that ozone is in a photochemical balance between ozone production and ozone loss. And the most important ozone loss cycles in the stratosphere are the catalytic cycles uh, that, that, that are listed here. And so depending on where you are in the stratosphere, those cycles have different importance. So the NOx cycle is very important in the mid-stratosphere, while other cycles are more important in the lower stratosphere, like the Clox and Brox cycle and the Hox cycle in different places. But it also depends on the season. So when we now uh, think about uh, that we add uh, aerosols to the stratosphere, of course, it depends on uh, the season and also the region and what chemical, uh, what chemical cycles uh, will be changed. And so I want to talk now 
about what are the impacts on stratospheric ozone and in processes in general. And so what you can see here on the left is uh, stratospheric aerosol intervention has been applied in the strong scenario. And uh, this is towards the end of the century. So we see a strong signal here. Uh, sulfur uh, has increased. This is the four injection scenario. And by the way, what I didn't say earlier, what I wanted to mention is you see a little bit imbalance here between the north and the south. There is more aerosols in one hemisphere. That is because this feedback control algorithm that we applied basically had to move more aerosol in one hemisphere because there was stronger warming in this uh, specific model version in the northern hemisphere. So we got more aerosols in this hemisphere. Although if you use a different scenario, a different model, a different model version, this actually uh, shows uh, an opposite signal, which is quite interesting. So it doesn't mean that it, this is, you know, how it would look like. It really is model dependent. And then if we look at the surface area density, there's more increase in high latitudes, uh, and that depends on the aerosol microphysics. You have smaller aerosols. Uh, in, in, in higher latitudes, then you increase the surface area density more than the tropics dis despite the mass. And what we see really is a strong signal of the temperature in the lower tropical stratosphere. So we see a strong heating um, right here that is because aerosol absorb and they heat uh, the temperature there. And what we also see as a result is that the tropopause, which will be really small, maybe you don't see it, the tropopause is reduced, but it's also warming. And that will result in much more water entering the stratosphere, less dehydration. And so we see in this scenario a strong increase up to, uh, I think it's 2 to 3 uh, ppm of, of water vapor. And uh, we also see changes in the zonal wind. Uh, we see a weakening of the subtropical jets and a strengthening of the um, polar jets. So uh, we basically um, accelerate uh, a little bit the brewer-dobson circulation above these injection points. And so when we look at chemical ozone change, that looks a bit, uh, it depends again on uh, where we look because um, we have different importance of ozone cycles. And since this is a bit uh, confusing, you see that the decrease in chemical ozone production is in blue and the increase in red. And so looking at this more in terms of um, different loss cycles here, uh, when we look in the, uh, in the southern hemisphere, uh, you can see that the um, uh, chlorine cycle and bromine cycle is very important, so we get a reduction here, but then there is also importance of the NOx cycle with increasing surface area density. We get an increase in ozone, uh, while in the, here in the tropics, uh, the, the NOx cycle is mostly important, and an increase in aerosols will uh, basically uh, reduce uh, these, the cycle because we uh, move, shift uh, NOx to NOA. And uh, in, in the northern hemisphere, the Hawk cycle is becoming also very important. So as you can see, it's complicated, but that's just the chemical change. And then on top, you get the dynamical change. And ozone changes in this scenario then look like this. So there's an increase and a decrease. And it, again, it depends on where you are in the region. It depends on the season as well. And then if you, for instance, look uh, early in the century, or not early, in, in mid-century of this scenario, you do get a strong reduction in the southern hemisphere, and then you get somewhat a little increase due to the uh, importance of the NOx cycle in the tropics, and again, a reduction in high latitudes in the northern hemisphere. But later in the century, we actually get increases in ozone. And I will talk about it a little bit more, but those increases are induced mostly by uh, on the one hand, the chemistry, but also the, the transport will move more ozone towards the high latitudes and increase um, here ozone. And so um, I want to now go over and look at different scenarios. And I first have a break. So yeah, it's, it's complicated itself. But now the question is really, what does it mean for the future? Do we, is it going to get worse? Is it going to get better? What does it depend on? So uh, what are we, I'm looking here is at uh, future projections on the left. And this is based on a <clears throat> paper by Keeble et al. 2021. 
who used uh, CCMI models. So this is a multimodal comparison um, and looked at the effects uh, on future ozone in different scenarios. Here on the left are the different scenarios. The purple, darker red one is the high forcing scenario and this blue, uh, I think it's the purple one, the, um, is the low forcing scenarios. <clears throat> So all of the scenarios, of course, in the, in the past, we see the reduction here in the southern hemisphere uh, due to the um, ozone hole. And then we do see a recovery. And when you uh, look at the ozone recovery, uh, all, the more, all the scenarios do recover, but it depends. Uh, a higher forcing scenario is recovering faster. And uh, that's uh, because, uh, first of all, with more greenhouse gases, we cool the stratosphere, which slows down, slows down the ozone-destroying cycles. But also, we get changes in the rhodopsin circulation, which speeds up. And then uh, the low-forcing scenarios actually show the slowest recovery of the ozone hole. Uh, if we look at the northern hemisphere, actually, the super recovery is much stronger. And in a high-forcing scenario, ozone is not going to go back to uh, pre-ozone uh, hole conditions. It actually will be much larger. And that's often said that if we reduce halogens back to pre-ozone uh, pre uh, pre hole conditions, we go back to the conditions that we had, but not uh, if we increase greenhouse gases <clears throat> in amount that, we, that is projected here. However, if we have a very low increase in greenhouse gases, ozone will not sh uh, show that strong of a super recovery. And uh, when we look at other regions, like in the tropics, um, the high forcing scenario is coming back to what was there, uh, to pre-ozone conditions, um, but a low forcing scenario is actually seemingly going further down. And this is that uh, we expect that uh, tropospheric ozone is declining due to the cleanup of pollutions. Um, compared to like uh, 1980 or 50 values. So we do go see actually a reduction in ozone with a low forcing scenario. Yeah, and I didn't, I mean the mid latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere behave very similar to the uh, high latitudes here. Now what happens when we add uh, geoengineering on top of this? So um, I talked about the two scenarios. And so what I'm going to do in the next, I will contrast basically two scenarios in terms of the effects on ozone. One is the uh, peak shaving scenario, and one is the strong SAI scenario. And what we did was a consistent model study uh, with uh, WECAM6. And this is the 8.5 high forcing scenario as the baseline for the strong scenario, and then we increased the emissions down to this 1.5 C target, which was in WECM 2020 conditions. And then the second scenario is this overshoot scenario, which is actually following exactly the 8.5 scenario to 2040. And then it will put in a lot of emission reduction and carbon dioxide removal. So you see the difference in the temperature in the future. And so this basically describes this temperature overshoot and needs uh, less injection. So in phase in of uh, aerosol, um, stratospheric aerosol intervention, and then a phase out again. And so uh, looking at the effects on ozone, um, here on the left, uh, we see the historical uh, evolution for um, on the same, same uh, scale. So we can actually compare it to the future changes. Uh, if we, starting with the strong SAI scenario in the polar region in the southern hemisphere in October, so the ozone hole season, uh, ozone is recovering. And um, as this very thin line here is the 2080 value, so we recover around 2040 here. Uh, so in the background, in the baseline scenario, 8.5, uh, we, we see the super recovery. When we apply SAI, we see a relatively strong drop. And then ozone stays about the same. And the reason for this relatively uh, fast drop in, in ozone is uh, that we do slowly phase in injections of aerosols. And so first, initially, we have smaller particles that uh, form larger surface area density, while later the particles grow and the relative uh, fraction between injection and increase in surface area density is reduced. So this kind of 
strongly decline then uh, follows into a continuous um, offset of ozone. And we see the continuous offset because we are still uh, continuing to increase injection in this scenario, but on the other hand, chlorine is declining. On this scenario, we do not increase the injections, but we reduce the injections and chlorine is declining, so ozone is slowly going back to the baseline conditions. And here on the bottom, you see the difference between this peak shaving and the strong SAI scenario. And uh, these reductions about, uh, in this case, about 40 to 60 Dobson units. And if we compare it to the past, it does actually not quite go as far, as far down as we had the experience in the past. So if people ask, is it getting worse? Well, if we would start in 2020, which we haven't, it wouldn't get worse. And probably if we start later, it may not because we we'll kind of uh, are already in a lower chlorine regime. But we will delay the ozone hole, uh, the recovery of the ozone hole by some time. Going towards the northern hemisphere, um, again, what you can see on the left is the historical compare, um, evolution of total column ozone. And uh, again, the strong st uh, SAI scenario. Um, we do see a slight reduction in uh, ozone um, initially. And we saw that when we looked at this uh, in ozonal plot, uh, that ozone is declining somewhat in the high latitudes. But then actually, there isn't that much of a change uh, for both of the scenarios. Um, we, we may or may not, it's very insignificant, but there are these two competing effects of chemistry, so a an increase in the chlorine cycle, but also with increasing injections and uh, the warming of the stratosphere, we get changes in transport that will not show much of a difference. However, it has to be, so, so basically we do in the large, uh, in the high forcing scenario, we still get a super recovery of ozone despite implying uh, keeping the temperature low because there are still all these greenhouse gases in the stratosphere, so ozone will still show the super recovery uh, even though we may keep temperatures to present day conditions. Um, there's also one caveat to that, and I think that's important. These uh, re results were performed on monthly averages, and they are ensemble means. But we know that the Arctic is very variable. It has very cold winters and very warm winters. And actually, nobody has, nobody has yet done a study to really look at the cold Arctic winter in these scenarios to say, what happens then? Well, that could really cause actually larger ozone loss, as has been shown earlier, but that has, still has to be looked at. So uh, going to the uh, one, one region in January, I looked at uh, January mid-latitudes because that showed a really strong uh, increase in ozone, sorry, in the um, high forcing scenario. And what we can see here actually is that ozone is with addition of aerosols even more increasing. So it's not a reduction in ozone, but an increase in ozone, uh, because uh, again, we do have uh, the NOx cycle very important in the tropical stratosphere, increasing ozone and then more transport to the winter hemisphere, which increases ozone and makes basically the super recovery worse uh, in case of stratospheric aerosol intervention. In the case of the peak shaving scenario, we do not see significant changes. And then in the tropics, um, here uh, we do see that actually SAI uh, at the, again, in the high forcing scenario could lead to more ozone, column ozone, while actually in the um, peak shaving scenario, it, it also leads to more ozone, but it goes more towards like uh, present day conditions. So uh, that's all now shown for different scenarios. One thing I talked about was different strategies. So what would strategies matter? And I'll just show one slide on that. So I said we, we can have the strategies of the four-point injection, we can have the one-point injection, we have lower injections. And all of that, just looking in October, uh, ozone loss, uh, you can see that you can get a difference with these different scenarios of plus to minus 20 Dobson units even. So uh, because it depends on how much heating you get, how high the aerosol layer reaches, and so on. So it's really hard to really say this is the amount of ozone loss you get with stratospheric aerosol intervention because it's so dependent on the details. 
And now I want to go over to something that is a multimodal comparison. We had three different models that we compared here in a multimodal comparison study that had all interactive ozone. Uh, and uh, what you've seen before was all within the WECAM framework. So we'll see what, what other models show. And so as I said before, these models performed this what we call medium SAI scenario high forcing and then some uh, injections that continue uh, to reduce temperatures to some medium uh, forcing scenario. And on the right, you see the amount of injection. And you may remember Danielle's seminar a few weeks ago. He talked a little bit about this and I will talk about ozone. So I'm not expecting that everybody, <laughs> that anybody remembers the Slides, but so when you look at the different injections for the different models, sorry, you do see that they need different amounts of injection. Um, they need a little bit of different timing when they inject to keep the same targets for some reason. And so you can imagine that that will change not only the amount of aerosols in the stratosphere, but then also will uh, impact ozone. But what it also does, despite, uh, we can see that it causes a very different amount of heating in the stratosphere. So the same experiment, at least very similar, there's a little bit different strategies applied to those, but we see very different amount of heating. And if you plot it here, there are actually uh, more models that participated in this uh, intercomparison project, but they did not all have ozone included. If you compare how much warming you get, you get about uh, 5 to 13 uh, degrees of warming in the lower tropical uh, stratosphere here for, um, what is this? I guess for, for a certain AOD of warming to, to, to the end of the century. So there's a huge, even not only that you get differences in how much injection you need depending on the scenario, also the models largely differ on how much warming they get and then you can imagine how much that changes in terms of what the impacts will be on the transport. But one thing we notice is that the three models that were actually of chemistry show a smaller range of this warming. So we think that there is a difference if you have interactive chemistry, it does give you, you know, probably a better answer on, on the uh, effects. But there are different radiation schemes and I get to the uncertainties in the end. So this is now the three models with chemistry, how the surface area density looks like. So very different surface area density um, will certainly impact ozone differently. And here is a time series of surface area density like in October. For the WECM model, what you can see is a initial increase in surface area density. As I described before, we have an interactive aerosol model and then uh, somewhat, you know, uh, an increase uh, later on. While the other models didn't even need much injection initially in the first 20 years to keep the temperatures from rising and then they had changed uh, the, the injection somewhat. So there's a large difference in the surface area density, and that's not only in October. If you look at different times, March in the high latitudes, there's a large difference as well. And uh, not surprisingly, the effect on ozone is different. This is the effect, so this is just the difference between uh, a case with and without SAI injections for those three models. And those models that didn't need much injection initially don't show much ozone loss initially, obviously. But uh, what we do see is that all models agree that we do get a reduction in the southern hemisphere. So I think the, that chemistry we do understand quite well. The more you inject, the more uh, reduction total column ozone happens. In the northern hemisphere, it's very uh, variable. Uh, that's uh, because of you know, uncertainties uh, and variability in the Northern Hemisphere Arctic. Uh, in the tropics, the models did not agree. And the one thing they did agree though was that we do get an increase with SAI application in the mid latitudes in winter in January. So what we are now doing is we have uh, model experiments uh, that the Chemistry Climate Model Initiative uh, many chemistry uh, models uh, will actually use a uniform experiment where we, we will provide or we just provided an aerosol distribution. So everybody has the same aerosol distribution that we can look at the effects on ozone to constrain those experiments a bit more because it's very difficult to even say what the effects are if you have so many variables uh, that change and that are different between the models. And that's maybe next seminar. <laughs> 
But uh, so for my last slides before the end, I just want to kind of summarize some of the challenges and uh, also differences in uh, what the processes are in different models, independent of the scenarios and the strategies. And uh, one important part is uh, the aerosol microphysics. Uh, models differ largely in how they describe aerosols, from very simple schemes, just uh, describing AOD, to uh, having a bulk aerosol scheme, to having a uh, scheme like our model aerosol scheme, where we have um, you know, different modes describing. And then the most complex is the uh, sectional aerosol scheme schemes that have been that describe aerosol distributions. And all of those uh, do, uh, there is actually a study showing very different results comparing a model and sectional model. And uh, as you know, we are working on implementing a sectional aerosol models to identify differences in the same framework in Beckham in, in, in the coming months. And so other differences between the models uh, is dynamics and transport. And very important is that models, um, yeah, I mean, some models have a very different vertical resolution. A much lower vertical resolution leads to different transport, different exchange in the UTLS, which definitely has a different response on also uh, how aerosols distribute, how they get uh, removed, and then uh, on the effects on the composition. Chemistry and UV is very different in the models. Only one model that I have shown had an interactive uh, UV scheme. We are having a prescribed lookout table for UV, and that also seems to change, especially ozone in the troposphere. I haven't discussed that much in this talk. Radiation uh, is important uh, and, and uh, is, is different in models, which cause different uh, heating rates. And one thing that I haven't discussed at all, but we usually don't run with the carbon cycle at all, and changes in uh, the carbon cycle can be caused uh, by aerosols. Uh, if you uh, change the incoming sunlight, the direct and the diffuse radiation, uh, there are changes that we don't take into account in our models that can have a big impact on uh, how, ge how SAI impacts the climate system. And, and uh, for impacts, which I haven't talked either uh, at all here, at, I mean impacts on the surface, on the climate, uh, we, we do only have very coarse model resolution, and uh, we cannot really uh, identify at the moment what the regional and local impacts are uh, because of the large-scale uh, modeling we are using. So something like Musica and other uh, applications uh, could be very interesting uh, to look at and, and to, to look at the effects on the local scale. And also, that's another thing, is that when you inject aerosols in a 100-kilometer box, it's not the same as what is happening either for volcanoes that inject uh, aerosol plume or, uh, or aircraft maybe that would inject through stratospheric aerosol intervention. You do not get the plume dynamics or the microphysics, which is something that also has been shown to can change quite a bit uh, what the aerosol distribution would be. OK, so to summarize. Um, yeah, so the effects of SII using sulfate aerosols on ozone depend on many specifics like the scenarios and direction strategies, the model complexity. I talked about this abrupt deepening of the ozone hole within 10 years. And uh, if we do start in 2020, we see in our model at least a reduction of about 45 to 65 dopsin units, which wouldn't be necessarily worse in the Antarctic, but it does delay the recovery of the Antarctic uh, ozone hole. And I would say there's definitely more research needed also for the Arctic. Uh, I say I does not revert ozone super recovery and can also uh, increase ozone, as I have shown. And you saw that, for example, in the tropics, at least in some models, and in mid-latitudes in winter for most models. Um, yeah, so SAI, a strong SAI scenario shows the largest long-term effects on ozone and also on climate, which I haven't really discussed here. And there are still large uncertainties due to limited modded studies, but also uncertainties and uh, uh, needed improvements in in Earth system models. And that's it for today. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you for, um, for your talk. It was super interesting, and uh, you summarized really well
an extremely rich uh, uh, topic that is rich of variables and things that could be uh, explored. Um, yeah, um, right. Um, we're gonna we're gonna mess with a highly unlinear system that we understand with large uncertainties. What could possibly go wrong? Um, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, there is a Slido question. Fantastic. It's the first time. Ah. Oh, thank you. Ah, Laura. <laughs> You're welcome, Laura, I guess, on behalf of Simon. I thought it was good. Uh, it's, yeah. Uh, so, Simone, very great, excellent talk, great summary of a lot of complex issues. Um, when you're thinking about ozone and what the different model responses are, what are the, you just showed the, you know, you basically just kind of showed SA sulfur and then you showed the endpoint, which was ozone. Are all the mechanisms in the models the same? Or, you know, can you describe what the pathway and the mechanism is for going to getting to ozone changes in the stratosphere? Yeah, I think this maybe does kind of point to what you mean, let's see, go back here, to the mechanisms. I tried to explain it a little bit uh, in this regard. So, you know, the first part is the sulfur distribution. There are uncertainties in the models, depending on the aerosol microphysics, depending on the dynamics itself, right? And then the surface area density as well, depending on the aerosol microphysics, how is it described? Um, it depends, I mean, yeah, it depends mostly on how do we even describe surface area density in the model itself. And then um, there are these uncertainty in the temperature change that's based on the radiative effects. Uh, if you have a different radiative scheme, you may get more or less heating. That goes also to cold point temperature, how much water there is actually in the stratosphere. Is it dehydrated or not? And how well do we represent that? And then to the changes in, in dynamics. Uh, you know, vertical resolution matters, uh, horizontal resolution matters, um, how our age of air is described, I mean, uh, resolved in the model. So I think, and, and that all depends on probably the dynamics of the model, the dynamical core. Is that about what you mean? And then there's the chemistry itself. But I think the chemistry is pretty well known in the community, at least the stratosphere chemistry. Uh, well, that doesn't mean actually that we do know the background aerosol layer very well. Um, yeah, that's, that's another thing that could change. Is that about what you asked? Well, Maybe I didn't. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, that's what I'm asking. The question is, you know, you said the chemistry is certain. Well, yeah, the mechanisms. Or the mechanisms are certain, but, but basically, which of these things then is dominating? Because the picture in the upper right looks really, it's not clear that it's the sum of any of those. No, no, so this is So can more... you explain what are the dominant impacts? Is it the surface area density? Is it yeah. the zonal wind okay. change? Is it the water vapor? And then I would say, well, um, the water vapor acts on the chemistry. The surface area density changes the heterogeneous chemistry. So if we know what the surface area density is, we can relate what the heterogeneous chemistry may be. However, it's depending on the temperature. It's depending on the water vapor. So it's not that easy to say what's the most important part. You can only say that they you know, come together. And the dynamics is mostly, I think, the main part. Because I think the dynamics is really the thing that will, the heating in this, let me go to the slide. If you have very different heating, that changes how your dynamics changes, right? And how much ozone you will actually get transmitted. And it's not only that it matters for ozone, actually. The heating in the stratosphere also matters for surface impacts on rainfall. We have seen that the more heating you impose, the more you can reduce, basically, the hydrological cycle, or not directly the hydrological cycle, but Isla Simpson had a great paper on showing that the heating is responsible for reductions over Indian monsoon, over the Indian summer monsoon. So there is a correlation there that, that's interesting, but it's also still research in progress, I would say. We don't fully understand it. But yeah, so what's the most important? I think the dynamics is a very important part of, of the whole question, but the chemistry as well. So 
<laughs> not a very, uh, yeah, I can't point to one. Okay, uh, we have a question from uh, Chuck Brock uh, via Slido. Nice talk, Simon. Obviously, surface area is dependent upon the correct representation of the size distribution. What observations do you need to constrain the models? Detailed size distributions, where, altitudes, latitudes, when, seasonal or so? Looks like Chuck is planning the next campaign. Next campaign. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it is. It is really good to. I mean, we not we don't get observations from geoengineering, obviously. But to constrain our models, we can do a few things. We can first look at the background stratospheric aerosol distribution and what comes up there. And that's where ACLOP is great, right? And then, yes, size distribution is very nice to constrain our model. We're actually using Chuck's size distribution that he, he put a nice paper together to compare to our mo uh, sectional aerosol model to see uh, we are we lacking some of you know, how, how do we compare and how do we not compare in our representation? So that's, that's really helpful to have. Uh, the other thing is, of course, we can study volcanoes. Right? We just had the Hunga Tonga volcano. We do have a bunch of, we hope for a bunch of observations, actually, that were performed. We ha don't have them yet. But that would be really uh, nice to compare. There is a challenge, though, because our model, as I said, it's 100 by 100 kilometers. And how do you compare those? point injections, I mean, you can compare basically observations later on when the plume has formed. And that's something that would be useful. If we have a large eruption, if we have an aged plume, for example, also to have observation of those uh, aerosol distributions, I think, would be useful. Any other question from the room? Peter now. So, Simone, I, I'm just imagining uh, when we would have this extra aerosol layer, um, the, the blue skies here will, will change, I assume. So, in Holland, I'm used to it, but here. Yeah, that's always, somebody did a study about the blue sky, and it's, I don't know uh, how much that actually is visible, but uh, the amount of aerosol that is injected, say we're talking about 10 teragram sulfate, and if you think about re-injecting in the anthropogenic aerosol, it's about 100 teragram sulfate per year right now. So the uh, anthropogenic pollution is pretty high in the troposphere, but of course that doesn't necessarily impact the sky. So a clear day, you may see a difference. But if we, I mean, yeah, it, it may change it, but it may prevent fire. So all the smog we have in summer, if you could prevent that with this type yeah, of yeah, stuff, yeah, you yeah, may yeah. rather have a little bit hazy star skies. But yeah. And the other question to you <laughs> is how are satellites impacted? And people have thought about it. So there is an impact on, say, big solar, pan uh, solar systems. Hmm. But th it was not calculated to be that large. But it's certainly still an open question. But what does it do to remote sensing if you always have an aerosol layer in the stratosphere? And yeah. I don't know that. No, I, I don't know the answer also at the moment. <laughs> we probably have to calculate it. But it also, uh, you're now looking at the impact on the ozone layer, which is, I think, crucial. Uh, but it will also impact our chemistry in, in the troposphere at some point because we have less radiation. Or yeah, there is a study. So um, there are different factors again. If you cool the surface, that will have a, that that seemed to have a largest impact, uh, say on the Hawk cycle. So it actually helped to um, reduce ozone, somewhat. Uh, yeah. The other large impact was the dynamics. If you have reductions in ozone due to geoengineering, so if we would do it now, and then you get less transport of ozone, that was another factor that impacted the tropospheric ozone. So what we've seen is that with as AI, we actually saw a reduction in tropospheric ozone. Hmm. But it, again, then it depends on, on the details. But it doesn't have to be an increase in, in tropospheric ozone. So there are actually studies that say that it would cause less uh, death for, for, from pollution when we would do SAI. But I don't know if, you know, that there's only one rough, or two, a couple, a few rough studies on that. Okay. One last question for you, last slide. Yeah. The last slide you showed. Mm, this one. <laughs> 
The, the summary or the, the uncertain? I think the, uh, uh, the summary, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the second point, you say abrupt deepening of the ozone hole in the first 10 years of the onset of SAI. And then you say between brackets, not worse than what we have already observed. Uh, so positive, positive point. Uh, but then at the end, you say still large uncertainty due to limited model studies. So how certain are you <laughs> that it's not worse? Well, I, I think for, I mean, I definitely not be certain for the Arctic because we have not even looked at the whole cold winter problem. Because you have a constant aerosol layer, you get really cold winters, and you have the aerosol. And you, you know, that could really make it worse. And, and we have kind of had a kind of rough study in the past on that. But uh, yeah, and I, I think one thing I'm also uncertain is really the dynamical response. I was already excited to see that all the three models, only three models showing an increase in the northern hemisphere because I was not sure if that's just our model or if it's other models too. So yeah, there is still a big question. And I, I would say for the WMO assessment we do, I uh, write you know, summary points. And I think one of the points will certainly be that we are not confident in the results we have currently. OK, thank you. We have uh, two questions from Slido. Um, great talk, Simon. Uh, you mentioned uh, increase in large-scale circulation. What are your thoughts about the impact of SAI on sudden stratospheric warming? Oh, no, I, I wish Yaga would be in the room. <laughs> she had looked at that, and uh, I think we get a strengthening of the polar vortex, so I forgot. I think we probably would get less uh, sudden stratospheric warming in that case. Yeah. I've, I kind of think, who asked that question? Shima Shams. <laughs> oh, yeah. OK, we'll come back to you. Yeah, OK. Uh, and then we have another question. And then we're going to wrap up. Duzong says, uh, thanks for the talk. I guess uh, if we could inject monodispersed and chemically inactive aerosols, yeah. spherical cow, uh, without any gas to particle reactions uh, in the atmosphere, then could we remove some uncertainties in models related to aerosol microphysics and chemistry? Yeah, and heating. If they wouldn't absorb, we wouldn't have the big heating problems. If, and that's what Frank Koich was here. Uh, people may remember, he came here and talked about uh, the whole question on what would be the better ideal aerosol to inject. And they're looking into calcium carbonate, which is a more inert tracer uh, aerosol I mean, in terms of at least heating, it, it wouldn't absorb so much. But then it does react. And they do uh, uh, right now, the, and uh, other groups are doing laboratory studies, actually, to look at the effects and see. You know, the idea was that that would react with chlorine and could actually pull out more chlorine out of the stratosphere and then uh, remove uh, or, or faster uh, clean out uh, the CFC or the, the chlorine. Uh, with uh, positive impacts in terms of we would not get a strong ozone hole, but we would get possibly increases in ozone that way. But it turns out that there are lab studies showing that the reactions aren't that strong as they thought. So what I would say is we are I, just at the beginning of exploring other aerosols, and but the, pro the other thing is that with sulfate, we know so much already. So we are years ahead with the research. And if people would want to apply this in the next whatever years, right? Uh, anything but sulfate uh, hasn't really explored sufficiently. So we really would have to start from the beginning to think that there is diamond. People talk about little diamond aerosols that, that would be great. And we get diamond rain for everybody to collect those. That's the best one yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Diamond dust, I heard that too. OK, uh, help me. Uh, thank you, Simon, once again. And thank you, everybody, for the lively conversation and for joining today. Next time is going to be June 6 with Lu Xu from NOAA uh, talking about ozone uh, in fire plumes. Thank you, Simon.